Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, the show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. The only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its net commissions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations dedicated to fighting climate change. Jessica, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much for taking some time to come on the show. I'm really excited to cover this topic. I've been wanting to do it for a while now. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to talk. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. And what we always like to do is get the show started with a bit of background information on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the current moment. Yeah, so I uh, have a sort of roundabout way of how I got to working on climate change um, and and specifically nuclear power. Uh, I was actually, my undergrad is in astrophysics and I started a PhD in astrophysics at University of Colorado, um, but I'd always been really Scobus. interested in, um, in environmental issues. Um, between undergrad and, and grad school, I worked in Alaska for the summer and was just really impacted there seeing, um, you know, permafrost melting and glaciers retreating. Uh, and um, uh, I can't remember what it's called, the beetle kill of the forest um, was really big up there. And this was also happened to be when Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth came out and it was a really hot summer and gas prices were crazy high. And so just everything kind of came to head. Um, and I decided that I wanted to work on um, environmental issues instead and, and climate change in particular. So I, I moved over and um, completed a master's degree in environmental studies with a focus on energy. And um, during my coursework there working on energy, um, we were really focused on renewables. Um, and I kind of noticed that looking at the, at the numbers that the U.S. had a lot of nuclear energy and that was where a majority of our low carbon electricity came from, but we just weren't talking about it in any of my classes. Um, and I was kind of curious as to why that was. So I started doing, you know, any project I could that was open. I do it on some aspect of nuclear and ended up teaching a course in my last semester on kind of interdisciplinary look at nuclear. And that's what kind of pulled me in. Uh, I didn't at the time and, and still don't. Um, I think that nuclear power is like the silver bullet for climate change. Um, I just thought it was an important contributor to low carbon energy and also had a lot of challenges and complexities that I wanted to work on. And um, that's that was over 10 years ago. So um, I'm still really interested in nuclear issues um, and I've been working on them ever since. Well, it's really cool. And we're, we're definitely going to get into it. And I must say you're, you're very brave, which is sad to say, because there's so much, I don't know if it's called like faux pas or negative energy being thrown at nuclear. And I'm, I'm a big believer in the idea of, of discourse to get out the truth. And when you demonize people and things, I think it's not very constructive. But before we do that, I'm just curious, like, what brought you to astrophysics originally? And what were you what were you going to do your PhD on? Yeah, um, well, like a lot of people that go into astrophysics, um, I got pulled in uh, by Carl Sagan, particularly the movie Contact. Um, yeah. And although I didn't end up working on extrasolar planets or, or anything like that, um, I was I did planetary um, astrophysics. So I was studying moons of Jupiter and comets. And um, I don't know, I just like... Uh, asking big questions about the universe and how it works. Um, and I think I learned a lot of important skills um, in astrophysics and I still love to follow what's happening um, with astrophysics and um, astronomy now, but I uh, thought we have a lot of problems down here on earth that need, need uh, smart minds on. That's true. It's fun to wander through the cosmos sometimes. <laughs> yeah. though. Um, so how did you end up in Alaska? Um, I have family there, um, and uh, you can get jobs in this. You can still, it's one of those places you can still get uh, kind of manual labor, not manual labor, but jobs where you don't need training that pay a lot and you can work um, like 70, 80 hour weeks um, and make a lot of overtime. So I did that for a summer and then spent a lot of time backpacking as well. Okay. 
Okay, fair enough. And can you tell a little bit more about like when the the moment kind of hit where you started getting really concerned about the environment? Was it watching Al Gore's film? I've spoken to people who have had that experience. Or it sounds like there was a a bunch of things that kind of happened in a small amount of time. Yeah, I think it was living in Alaska and um, specifically the work I was doing there. I was working for the state fire warehouse. So they um, coordinate the supplies and the people going to um, wilderness fires to fight fires. And so seeing these huge swaths of land on fire every summer, um, you know, at the same time as watching An Inconvenient Truth and um, just kind of, yeah, everything kind of came together for me. Okay. And then when did you like plug in the nuclear piece? If it wasn't being taught to you in school, were you doing a lot of independent research on energy or what? Um, it was actually, it kind of came to me in one of my classes um, that we were looking at um, how to decarbonize uh, the energy sector as an assignment. And everyone was given a country to look at. I had Poland. And the assignment was to kind of do a really simple, you know, Excel spreadsheet decarbonization scenario for that country to get them to 50 percent or 80 percent below 1990 emissions. And um, I just realized that, you know, it's really hard to do. And it's even harder if you don't include nuclear, um, sort of the number of plants you need and, um, you know, running a, a energy system, not just a power system. Um, off of renewables is very challenging for a lot of reasons. Uh, and we have a lot of nuclear running already. So it kind of seemed like, why are we reinventing the wheel if we already have this low carbon source of electricity uh, is kind of what pulled me in. Was there any talk of offsets during that time? Mm, wasn't a big focus. Because um, again, I think, my coursework in particular was was focused on energy and energy systems. So it was about you know building and clean energy. Um, I think definitely in probably other people's work in environmental policy, there was a lot because that's a huge um, uh, area of research. Yep. Definitely continues to grow each day. Well, really cool. Thanks for sharing. I'm going to ask you the big. We don't have the answer, but I'm going to look for it anyways. Question: What are your initial thoughts on the the, the best way, the most realistic way to achieve decarbonation? Let, let's say stay in in the United States in okay. particular. Um, so right now, 20% of U.S. electricity comes from nuclear power. I think it definitely needs to stay at that 20%. But we also need to expand how much electricity we generate if we're going to be electrifying transportation, heavy industry. Um, so there's room for growth. I like to think of it, I don't know how much I can make hand signals, but um, <laughs> uh, nuclear and hydro are kind of this base layer of uh, low carbon electricity. And then at the top, um, you have the intermittent renewables, wind and solar. Um, so, and then in the middle, I think you have natural gas, which is balancing. And so ideally you wanna have that base of nuclear and hydro growing, and you wanna have the share of wind and solar growing, and they're coming together to, to eat out natural gas or just carve out um, or phase out natural gas, uh, nuclear and hydro coming from the bottom and wind and solar coming from the top. Um, and of course, batteries also help in that balancing as well and, and other renewable sources. But that's kind of how I see. Um, and I don't I don't like to put exact numbers on exact percentages like uh, sure. we need to reach 40 percent nuclear. It's going to be. We need to build as much as we can of all low carbon sources and they'll, they'll meet in the middle somewhere. So what, what exactly is nuclear power? Because like when you say nuclear power, people think of like Chernobyl, three mile Island, like right away. And I don't know if that's like, cause we were conditioned to think that, or people think of like the Hiroshima bomb. Like I, I, I actually don't even know how nuclear power works at all. I know there's like rods that you pull <laughs> out or something like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, for the last couple of summers, I've taught a course at UC Santa Barbara on um, energy. And I do give a basic lecture on how nuclear works. And I start by just saying for the most part, you know, a nuclear power plant looks very similar to a coal power plant. Uh, you have something 
that generates heat. You have a fuel that generates heat and you use that heat to boil water to turn a turbine. Uh, now what actually happens in the fuel is very different. So with coal and natural gas and even wood and biomass, you're using combustion. So you're breaking molecular bonds. Um, that's as far as I'm gonna go down into the chemistry. Good. Um, so you need oxygen and you're combusting a fuel. Um, with nuclear, we often colloquially say you're burning the fuel, but you're not burning it. There's no combustion. What you're doing is you're taking a heavy element uranium and you're fissioning it in two which releases a bunch of energy uh, that is what happens in a nuclear bomb um, but in a nuclear um, reactor for power uh, the condition is very controlled um, and so it happens at a stable rate and it releases a lot of heat which is again just used to boil water and turn a turbine right and i think there's it's it's weird that there's there's these big smoke stacks I think at the nuclear facilities and yeah, they're, they're not releasing smoke. all they're not smoke <laughs> yeah they're it's it's water vapor right it's water vapor yeah and actually um you know a lot of the nuclear power plants in the U S don't have those and that's because they were built um, before the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts which regulate the temperature of water that you can release to the environment so. Um, the odds are, if you see those big cooling towers in the U.S., it's probably a coal plant, um, just by the numbers. But a lot of people associate those towers with nuclear power. Um, it actually can be used for any sort of power plant. Um, and you also don't need them if you use a different kind of cooling system. So, yeah, it's just steam, though, coming out. And because you're not combusting the fuel, that's why there's no greenhouse gases, um, because you're not getting that oxidizing reaction. Right. And you're talking about increasing the number of nuclear power plants that we have because it's a it's a zero it's a zero carbon energy. Yeah. Source, when operating, it? there's, you know, life cycle emissions from building the plant, but that's the same for, for anything, wind or solar included. Yeah. And what's going on now is we're we're closing plants, aren't we? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of closures in the past kind of five or ten years. Um, mostly for economic reasons, because natural gas is so cheap. Um, so that's what's been replacing nuclear or why utilities are making the choice to close down nuclear. Oh, it's it's mostly for, for money. Yeah. Huh. I didn't know that. Because um, we have we don't have constraints on carbon in, in most parts of the US. Um, so if you can close down a nuclear power plant and replace it with gas generation, maybe of excess gas capacity because gas, the fuel is so cheap right now. Um, the electricity from gas is also cheap. Well, that's just terrible, isn't it? Just borrowing, <laughs> borrowing from future generations to save money now is essentially what that is. How, how much of the, the global energy system is powered by nuclear right now? I think is Germany- it's about 10%. Or no, Japan? France. France, France. France. Yeah, about, for France, it's about, I think it's now down to like 75% of their electricity comes from nuclear. Um, it's actually not number one in terms of percentage. There's some Eastern European countries and smaller countries that are, are higher percentages, but, um, France definitely has sort of the biggest, um, presence in the nuclear space because so much, um, they're a large country that also has a large percentage of their electricity coming from, um, nuclear. Now in terms of number of reactors, um, Japan was number two, um, but they've closed down several, um, I think China is going to be surpassing Japan soon in terms of number of reactors. And so they'll be second to the U.S. The U.S. has the largest number of operating nuclear power reactors. Well, that's interesting. And yeah, there's a lot of talk around China being like the largest polluter, which I think is the case. But what people might not realize is that they're investing heavily into low carbon tech as well, which is definitely something to keep in mind. It's hard to keep up with all the ener the uh, information, but um. Well, Jessica, can you tell me about the Good Energy Collective? What exactly is that? Yeah, so um, some colleagues or some people I worked with from different organizations, we started talking about um, almost two years ago now um, about how there was this big movement in um, the climate space towards uh, um, younger organizations um, that were much more aggressive about what they were calling for in terms of mitigating climate change compared with the sort of older traditional environmental organizations. Um, 
And they were actually making a lot of headway. So this was particularly around the Democratic pre presidential primary um, in 2020. Um, just seeing how much they were able to move the needle on um, what, for example, candidate Biden um, was committing to, you know, Biden, who was pretty moderate and a lot of people thought pretty lukewarm on on his promises around climate change when he was a candidate, um, ended up forming this um, uh, task force with the Sanders campaign that they released um, called the Unity Task Force. And they um, committed to very aggressive targets and plans on decarbonization. And people were surprised by that. And it was really the result of these um, younger, really energetic climate groups uh, and similar momentum in um, Congress. You know, these new progressives coming in and really pushing hard um, on climate change. I think that was great. Um, and there also had been, uh, in the last five years, a lot of good um, bipartisan legislation around advanced nuclear, around new nuclear in the U.S. Uh, and we were kind of wanting to see someone bridge these two. So there really wasn't a group at the time that could do progressive policy with nuclear um, and could find ways to um, integrate nuclear into this broader climate agenda. And so that's why we started Good Energy Collective um, was to do research and develop policies uh, that um, advance nuclear as one tool in fighting climate change, but in a way that aligns with progressive values. So is it like an advocacy, like a co-op or a nonprofit? No, it's, it a, it's a research organization or a think tank. Um, so we don't do advocacy um, and we don't take industry funding. Um, so we're mostly, you know, doing the research to try and find better policies, um, talk with people, educate people about um, different options. But also we do a lot of listening because there are um, from progressive groups, there's a lot of concerns about nuclear, which are very valid. There's a lot of environmental justice concerns around nuclear and legacy issues from nuclear. Um, and so we want to work on um, those challenges and not just sort of be going out, rah, 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 let's build nuclear. Um, so it's there's a lot of hard work in there, um, but it is um, sort of the right time to be working on it. Could, could you speak a bit to like the public concern around nuclear? Um, Beyond waste, what are the other fundamental issues people have with the source of energy that, as I understand it, a tiny bit of uranium can power like a lot of stuff. So it seems like a pretty good option. I'm just trying to understand yeah. what's going on. So um, there's a lot of different concerns around nuclear. You know, you mentioned waste. Um, so the spent fuel that comes out of the reactor after every two years when it's refueled. Um, there's concerns around where that fuel is sourced, the mining and processing, um, concerns around safety or on accidents. You mentioned, you know, Chernobyl and, um, Fukushima and Three Mile Island, these big accidents that we have in our mind. Um, and there's lots of different reasons that people have these perceptions around nuclear. You know, one big challenge is that nuclear technology was introduced to most people, um, first through atomic weapons. Um, and it's very separate, you know, industries now that the military and civilian side, but for a lot of people, it's it's one and the same. Um, and I could address all of these different topics, but I think one sort of big grouping of how people think, how a lot of people think about nuclear um, is they think of it as this big uh, kind of top down government source of energy. And then you see this in surveys where people often will group nuclear with fossil fuels, not definitely not with renewable energy and not with clean energy or not with green energy. So people think of it like a fossil fuel. Um, and so a lot of times when you're thinking about climate change or you're thinking about environmental issues, if you um, you know don't follow them closely, you're like, well, nuclear is bad, right? Like everyone knows that. Uh, and I think it's hard to disentangle all of those different causes. Um, but some of them are very valid. Uh, and so I really dislike when nuclear advocates say, you know, fear of nuclear is irrational because there's lots of rational reasons that people don't like nuclear, including 
you know, contamination from nuclear weapons production that poison communities, um, how the mining was done on, a lot of it was done on indigenous lands um, and very um, poor public health and environmental records there. Um, and so, you know, nuclear has improved a lot and it can be done in a very safe and sustainable way, but the history is not great. Uh, and so I think um, finding ways to um, repair and uh, remediate those those legacy issues in a meaningful way um, just has to go hand in hand with any sort of new nuclear or expansion of nuclear going forward. Can you explain a bit how it's improved or is that like too super technical Adams stuff? <laughs> no. So there's, a, I mean, we just, for, for all sorts of things, we have better regulations on um, environmental impact. So, you know, starting with, um, uh, you know, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, and the National Environmental Policy Act, which is, um, where we started doing environmental impact statements for large projects. Um, so much better transparency, much better assessments of the environmental impacts of any kind of project. Um, you know, that's really helped uh, for all sorts of things, including nuclear. And then the mining, um, you know, mining has just, again, because of regulation, um, has cleaned up across all sorts of sectors, not everywhere, of course. Um, I'm talking about, you know, countries that have good governance um, and good regulation uh, around mining issues. Um, that's improved. And where the U.S. gets um, a lot of their uh, uranium fuel now is from places like Canada and Australia. Um, mining which have, uranium? Is that like a, like a rock, like a radioactive rock? Like yeah. It? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's an ore. Um, yeah. Or. So there, it's concentrated in certain countries, particularly that's a little technical, but places that have really old rock formations. Um, so big parts of Australia, Canada, um, Russia, Kazakhstan is also a big one. Um, but the, you know, oversight and um, regulation on mining has improved. That's a small, that's a maybe a, it's an important thing. But um, yeah. in terms of safety, um, for new nuclear um, nuclear that's going to start being built in sort of the next five, 10 years or is being built right now. Um, there's improvements in how the plants are designed to have sort of safety built in from the start. Um, we did learn a lot from operating nuclear power plants since the 1960s. Um, and we're also better able to sort of model different types of accidents and different types of scenarios to understand, you know, how to manage those things. Um, and there's, the big thing, and this is a simplification, um, but I think it's in a good way to explain to people is um, new nuclear designs have moved from heavily engineered or and redundant safety systems to um, passive or intrinsic safety systems that rely more on laws of physics rather than engineering systems. So um, an example that I like to use, there's lots of different things that go into that, but one example is, um, you know, some of these new nuclear that's um, working to get demonstrated right now relies on passive cooling um, or convective cooling. So how you can think about this is you have a pot of soup that's boiling. Um, if you turn off the heat, that soup is going to cool down naturally using convection. So the hot stuff is going to rise to the top as it cools and it's going to fall back down. And uh, you don't need to be like pumping that soup around to cool it or pumping cold water into the soup. It's going to cool naturally on its own. Um, and that's what well, some of these new reactors do through um, the geometry of how they're structured, through the types of coolants that they're using. If you use um, things like molten salt or molten metal, um, it can do that convective cooling much better. And even some of these light water reactors, which is more traditional nuclear technology, um, are being designed to take advantage of that convective cooling. Um, and so that, if there is something that goes wrong and the fuel gets too hot, the reactor kind of shuts down on its own and then can cool down to background levels um, without the need for a bunch of human intervention and sort of multiply redundant safety systems. Yeah, well, it, it definitely sounds a lot more efficient, which is just always better. Um, 
I'm curious how you became so bullish on nuclear in particular, because when I talk to a lot of environmental advocates who are in, very interested in bringing down CO2 emissions, it seems there's a lot of discussion around solar, a lot of discussion around wind, and there's a big movement for people to use less energy and do less things, which is a whole discussion into itself on the the viability of that. And then I think the next the next thing people talk about is just general innovation and of course electrifying things as well i'm i'm wondering why nuclear is so appealing to you as because you and i both know we we're kind of really behind on the whole co2 emissions thing uh so so why why nuclear in this piece of the puzzle when i read drawdown it's like a very small piece of that book and i was like perplexed by that yeah. So there's two reasons. So the first one is um, you can get pretty far with renewables and and just with wind and solar. So they need to scale up a ton. Um, and they're doing that. You know, they're coming down in cost. Um, they're increasing their penetration. That's great. Um, it's not happening fast enough. Uh, and then the other issue is that um, there is um, a limit to how much renewables you can have and still be economic. And the reason for that is, as I'm sure you know, uh, they're intermittent. So sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. Um, and when you have a system that has a lot of those sources on the grid, um, think of Denmark, think of Germany, um, you start to have trouble with the grid, uh, maintaining that balance of power. Uh, and you need something to back it up. Now, right now we have this overabundance of fossil fuel, so it's not an issue because you can just burn more coal or in the U.S. more natural gas to balance them. Um, but as we start moving towards a fully decarbonized system, which we need to, um, running 100% of your grid on uh, intermittent renewables has huge challenges. So the, the first one is you have to way overbuild the system. So if you need, you know, one terawatt of power, you might have to build five terawatts of wind and solar. Um, I just made those numbers up, but it's about that order. Um, and that can be very expensive. Uh, and also because in a lot of places, um, you know, the, the resource is um, sort of geographically correlated. So when it's windy, you get a ton of wind. And if the wind stops, you get no wind. Um, and that can have huge impacts on the grid as well. So how to get to 100% zero carbon uh, when you look at modeling and do the energy systems modeling, and there's been great work out of Stanford, MIT, uh, Princeton, uh, it just really helps to have low carbon baseload available. It doesn't have to be nuclear. That could be hydro, that could be geothermal, um, but geothermal and hydro are both geographically constrained in where you can have them and where they make economic sense. So nuclear is sort of the one um, that's more a little more on demand can be built anywhere and you see this historically places that have built a lot of nuclear not the US but places like the UK and Japan did it in the 60s and 70s because they did not have access to enough fossil fuels that they needed to run their economy so that was all one reason <laughs> the second one um, and to your point about using less energy is that there are just a lot of people on earth that don't have enough energy right now don't have enough modern energy um, you know, there's over a billion people that don't have access to modern energy and they are going to be, um, industrializing their economies, um, getting access to modern energy over the next decades. And so the amount of electricity that the world needs is going to be increasing two or three times by 2050. And even more than that, if we're looking at electrifying outside of the power sector, or electrifying more industries. So like, transportation, uh, heavy industry, um, more things like uh, using more energy in agriculture so that it's more um, sustainable, uh, things like that. Um, that means we're going to need even more electricity than just to meet the needs of a growing population with growing standard of living. So um, sure, like you and I maybe could run our dryer less and um, air dry our clothes and that would save a little bit, but there's people that need orders of magnitude, more electricity, more energy to live um, full modern lives, uh, and we can't just sort of tell them no. 
Yeah, and that's it's it's great to hear your perspective. And let's let's dig a little bit further into that. As I understand it, you have a, a second project you're involved with called Energy for Growth Hub. Is that right? Do you want to explain what that is? Yeah, so I'm a I'm a fellow with Energy for Growth Hub. It's a fellow. great organization. Yeah, founded by um, Todd Moss, and um, they're specifically focused on this this issue of um, expanding not just energy access. Um, but energy consumption to improve um, human development and well-being. Uh, and so they're looking at, you know, what's realistic um, and what's, um, you know, fair and equitable and what countries actually want when they're increasing their energy consumption. Um, and part of what I've been um, doing with my work for them is looking at um, the possibility and the potential of nuclear in emerging economies in um, lower income countries that are looking to uh, expand their industrial capacity and they're going to need a lot more energy. Um, this isn't a crazy thing. Nuclear has been built in low income countries in the past. Um, I think Brazil, Argentina, um, India, Pakistan, China, um, South Korea uh, at the time. And, um, Countries use it to sort of power their economic growth and power their industrialization. And so there's a lot of countries that want to do that now. There's over 30 countries that are pursuing their first nuclear power plants, um, or pursuing commercial nuclear programs. So um, it's you know very unfair for higher income countries who already have a lot of nuclear to say like, oh, it's not really uh, great if you do that because you know they need energy and they don't have a lot of options. Yeah, well, it's better that than them burning coal or or dung in their house. Um, how how do you d deal with the uh, the issue around other countries being like nuclearized? And there's like a lot of effort to denuclearize countries. Is is the the power and the weapons are they on a whole different scale, kind of thing? Um, yeah. So when you say nuclearize, are you talking about nuclear weapons or nuclear energy? Right. Well, th th that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> okay. there's the idea like, okay, there's this country that doesn't have any nuclear power at all. And maybe they have a, a way of life that's contrary to like the Western view is them allowing them to have nuclear power aren't wouldn't like isn't that isn't that a concern for people who are worried about them coming and attacking us with weapons? Yeah, so there is a concern for sure. And um, there is um, a historical issue of, you know, who um, the US and European countries sort of let have nuclear power for that reason. Um, because specifically in the on the fuel side, on the uranium side, um, the some of the technologies that you would use to produce fuel or a nuclear power plant can also be used to produce weapons grade material. I think the connection is not as strong as um, kind of the general public thinks. And I'll point to a few examples. So there's only nine countries that have nuclear weapons and there's over 30 countries that have nuclear power. Most of the countries that have nuclear weapons got weapons first before they had nuclear power. Um, or they don't have nuclear power. So there's there's countries that just have weapons and um, have never had a nuclear power plant uh, because it's a different industry and it's done through military means. Um, there are very good um, oversight mechanisms for the nuclear power sector. So there's the International Atomic Energy Agency, which sets up um, the system called safeguards. There's an international treaty called the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty which countries sign on to. And for example, if a country wanted to start a commercial nuclear power plant, um, let's say Ghana, because they are interested, um, they're not gonna build it themselves, most likely. They're going to work with uh, a vendor, uh, maybe from the US, maybe from France, maybe from Russia or China, to build that plant. And most countries wouldn't build a nuclear power plant in a country that hasn't signed on to these non-proliferation agreements, that doesn't have good um, safeguards and security in place. Um, and also the, the big risks really come from fuel production. And most countries are not going to be producing their own fuel. They're just going to buy it um, from a, a country like France or Russia, because um, just for economic reasons. So if a if a country is saying we want a power plant, we're going to import it from the U.S., we're going to get the fuel from Russia, like 
it's not a big concern. There's, it's very hard for them to divert any materials because they're going to have inspectors and they're going to have safeguards. Now, if a country was saying, okay, we want to start a fuel fabrication facility or an enrichment facility, uh, and we, you know, want all of our own people in there and we don't want inspectors and that's, that's a big risk. And that's, you know, what happens and what's been happening in, um, places like Iran with their enrichment facility. So we do have, we do have mechanisms for finding that out. It wasn't a, it's not a secret usually. Um, so the, yeah, the connection is there's not so much of that. Like we're building a nuclear power plant, but secretly it's going to be used for weapons production. That's very hard to do in modern times. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for explaining that. It's, it's really good to know. And when you're talking about fuel, you're talking about this or uranium, right? Yeah. So I, I did want to ask you one thing we didn't I didn't bring up was um, when it came to talking about decarbonization is the essential uh, need for batteries and innovation in batteries. I was wondering what the difference in specifically the the mining impacts of mining uranium versus like something that would be needed for like a big, big battery to store the when the wind is not blowing. Um, the the uranium is a fuel and, and batteries are, are storing energy. Um, uh, but one difference is, so the uranium is very, very dense. So you don't need a lot of it by volume um, for for generating electricity. For storing energy in batteries, it is becoming more of an issue. So I've you know been reading, uh, there's articles, it seems like every day from New York Times or Bloomberg about mining issues around renewable energy batteries, but also elements, um, particularly this group called rare earth elements that are needed for a lot of um, renewables applications. Um, you know, the mining is not done in great places. A lot of it's done, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of, I think, cobalt in DRC. Um, a lot of the rare earth elements are mined in China or processed in China, if not mined somewhere else. Um, and they don't have great standards on environmental protections, labor protections. Um, so that is a big challenge. Um, as I said, kind of because we've been using uranium for nuclear power for so long, um, it's more of an established um, industry that has better oversight and better control. So it wasn't always like that. And there's lots of um, you know bad examples um, from nuclear's history around uranium mining, but. Um, if it's being done in a place like Canada or Australia or even Kazakhstan, they have good oversight and good regulations there. Now, I think what's worrying is there's a lot of elements um, or minerals that go into batteries and renewable energy that we just don't have established industries for in um, countries with good governance and good regulation on mining and environmental impacts. So um, that is a hard, um, hard issue to solve. Um, yeah. because, you know, we need a lot of them. Um, and how to sort of, do we want to scale up mining in the U S for those elements if we can, or do we want to try and, um, push through regulations, maybe at the international level around certain minerals, um, to try and, um, sort of push through better labor regulations and environmental regulations in other countries. That's, that's also very hard to do. There's a lot of complexity involved. <laughs> Hard to keep up with it. Glad we got people like you studying it all. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing. I really would yeah. just like the, to end the, the podcast by exploring the idea of comparing the different waste products that come out of our energy sources. So could you begin by explaining what exactly nuclear waste is and then maybe yeah. explain how it compares to like CO2 going into the atmosphere? Yeah. So... The, the really weird thing about nuclear waste is that um, it's actually still has most of the useful energy in it. Um, so it's also why we sometimes try to call it spent fuel instead. So um, when you pull the nuclear fuel out of the reactor after two years, um, it still has about 96% of its useful energy in there. It just can't um, maintain that stable nuclear reaction anymore um, because of some physics um and chemistry but um it's really hot and is really radioactive so it needs to be stored securely while it cools down and so that's what you'll see these big pools with spent fuel in them or these big concrete casts uh and the u.s is is looking for a repository to put all this fuel in one place 
But what other countries do, um, what France, Japan, a lot of European countries do, is they recycle that spent fuel and they use it again. So they get twice as much energy out of it. And then you have a much smaller volume of waste that you need to store. You could recycle it many more times. Um, it's a different process, but you could um, recycle it more. Or you could use different types of reactors. Some of these advanced reactor technologies um, can kind of run on that waste or run on reprocessed fuel, get a lot more energy out and um, leave us with a very tiny volume of waste that needs to be stored. Um, why we don't do this is in almost entirely economics. It's more expensive to do it that way. Um, but there is a lot of energy in there. Um, so that's what comes out of a nuclear reactor. And then the other output is um, steam usually uh, from the turbine. But if you have, um, again, other types of nuclear reactors that are in development are air cooled instead of water cooled for their electricity production, then you don't have that steam. Um, so that's how a combined cycle gas turbine runs. You don't have steam coming out of a, out of a gas turbine either or um, aircraft. Um, so very little is coming out of that nuclear power plant. Um, with renewables, you do still have a waste stream. So you have waste streams oh, yeah. in the mining, um, but you also have end of life waste. So, um, we're just starting to talk about this issue of what to do with wind turbines at the end of their life, what to do with solar panels at the end of their life. Um, can they be recycled? Where can they dispose of them? They have a lot of really toxic stuff like cadmium in solar panels. Um, and making sure that's handled well. So this is um, something that's, you know, across all energy technologies, uh, you know, coal power plants have these ash ponds um, that need to be contained and, and managed well to keep from contaminating drinking water. So uh, I think there just needs to be much more of looking at all energy technologies, sort of warts and all, um, and, not sort of grouping as like, this is a good one and this is a bad one. It's like, they all have trade-offs, they all have mining issues, they all have waste streams and we have to manage all of them to be as sustainable as we can. Um, if we're gonna be reaching a 100% uh, carbon-free electricity future. That is an amazing, honest perspective that I appreciate <laughs> so much. And I wanna back it up a little bit to explain to people that after I'm, I'm I'm not sure if it's 25, 30 years, whatever. Um, I I know it's like 25 years. The blades on the wind turbines are retired, and they're burying them in the ground, which is bonkers. And yeah. the the solar panels, same thing. I think it's the same amount of time, 25, 30 years. The whole panel is essentially tossed. Is that right? Um, yeah, right now. I mean, we're starting to see more efforts on recycling them, but okay. you know, it's hard. <laughs> it's always cheaper to, to start from scratch. And you just explained to me something I've never heard before, which was you were saying that the uranium waste from a nuclear power plant, if we had the correct expensive process could actually be used even more and then decreased in size. Yeah, the the eventual waste that's left over at the end is much smaller in volume because you've gotten more, you've burned more of it in the reactor. Have you heard this um, idea that the typical American could like live their whole life and produce like a Coke can's worth of nuclear waste? Um, yes. Well, how I've heard it is that the amount of uranium fuel that you would use to power your whole life is about, is about the Coke can. But I, the waste is, is probably pretty similar. I mean, the entire amount of waste that we have in the U.S. from our entire commercial nuclear industry going back to the 1960s could fit on like a soccer field, um, I think like three meters high. So the just total volume is not that huge. Now it's, you know, it's radioactive. It needs to be handled properly, but the actual volume is not unreasonable, yeah, um, very manageable. And um, it's just in a lot of places right now. Yeah, but then think about how much crap we have in landfills and people yeah. are concerned about a soccer field's <laughs> amount of waste to power the whole country for what you just said was 70 years. I, it's just perspective isn't there. It's I, 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 I'm trying to be someone who can provide lots of information for people. It'd be great if there was like one website that explained everything in like short bullets, but maybe that's something I'll pursue at another point. <laughs> um, why do you think like the environmental community is so hesitant to 
to like talk about this stuff or adopt these ideas when solar and wind are creating immense amount of waste as well and have similar issues just like nuclear? Well, I think it is changing. And, you know, we've seen um, people working, specifically people that are very focused on climate change, um, are becoming more pragmatic about energy solutions. So even, you know, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has said Green New Deal is open to nuclear because you just, it needs to be. Um, and so we are seeing, I think, more of a shift in um, environmentalists as long as they're they're focused on climate change because there it's just hard it's hard to make the case that you don't need nuclear. Um, I think for the older environmental groups or the incumbent environmental groups like Sierra Club, Greenpeace, a lot of them are really founded as anti-nuclear groups and that's anti-nuclear weapons for the most part. And that's, you know, I'm not going to argue against that. That's, it's great. We needed them. Um, but they've kind of retained that in their DNA. Um, and so it's, it's hard to change. Um, it's sort of wrapped up in their identity as being an environmental organization. Uh, because in the 60s and 70s in the US, those kind of went hand in hand. Um, but environmental problems have become more complicated and the solutions have become more nuanced. And now that we're actually where the rubber meets the road in terms of um, committing to deep decarbonization, uh, it's much harder um, to sort of say, well, we have to do it with just these, you know, these small scale technologies. Do you think there's going to be a big shift when we eventually hit like actual scalable fusion technology? Um, yes. Uh, it, I mean, depends. It might be that we get fusion, but it's really expensive or. Um, and it doesn't produce waste, right? Fusion. Or yeah. Wrong? Um, so if, I mean, it, it does make some local things radioactive and sort of the core, but it's a much more manageable problem. And you don't have this like waste stream coming out. Um, I definitely think that could change people's minds. I think um, some of this new nuclear can also change public perception, particularly when it's a lot smaller. Um, so something I focused on in my research um, in my PhD dissertation was micro reactors. So these are nuclear power plants that are less than 10 megawatts. So that's like the size of a wind turbine in terms of electricity production. Um, these could be used for off-grid applications, for sort of island communities. Um, and I think when people start seeing nuclear generating electricity at the local level, that might help shift, um, especially if they have a lot more local control or local ownership over it. It's not this sort of big thing from this investor-owned utility that you don't know how it works and you've never visited and it's like a big thing off in the distance. Um, I think that could help change perception as well. It's not just about the technologies, it's about how they're owned and operated and managed. Um, if it can be much more um, community-based and community-focused, I think that could help a lot, which is yeah. why renewables are so popular is you can put solar on your roof. Right now, you can't put nuclear in your backyard, even if you wanted to. I'm all for that. Anything that can give the power to the people and keep it away from large, large businesses or large government institutions seems like it could be cool at the very least. Is that what they're working at at MIT, that the micro reactor or is that I'm um, thinking of something else? Yeah, there there have been micro reactors uh, concepts that have come out of MIT. Um, and yeah, there's there's several different companies working on micro reactors um, and over like 60 companies working on different advanced nuclear concepts in the U.S. Cool. Yeah. So fission is like you're cutting a uranium atom and that's creating uh, heat, which is spinning yeah. a turbine and fusion is you're combining atoms you're, and that yep. creates more energy for some reason. Cause yeah, physics, you're combining right? two light atoms. And fission is you're splitting one big heavy atom. And yeah, they both make energy, which is confusing, but that's how the physics works. Yeah. Well, physics is cool. I just don't understand it. <laughs> Jessica, I've, I've loved having you on. I really, really appreciate your perspective. It's very logical and honest. And <laughs> it was just, it was a pleasure. I always love to ask people at the end, any advice you have for young people who are passionate about creating a better world and solving these large problems? Uh, I think one of the the biggest lessons I've learned is listening to people that um, don't agree with you, particularly around environmental issues. They probably have good reasons and um, you may not agree with them, but it's good to know their reasons. Uh, and that's that's helped me a lot over the years. Yeah, I'm a big believer in having discourse and the truth will ring out over time. 
Jessica, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a Yeah, thanks pleasure. for having me and thanks for these great questions. No worries at all. All right, everybody, and we will see you soon. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrboulder.com today.